you. So feel free to eat something loud. It's not rude at all. Encouraged, honestly. Uh, we're so excited to have our guests here tonight and we cannot wait to talk about Glenn Burke. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Could not, oh, a lot of people are filing in. Heck yes, it's gonna be a great event. It'll be a lot of awesome discussion. Cannot wait. <laughs> Give people a few more seconds. All right, let's do it. Hello everyone and welcome to PNP Live. My name is Ellie, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a bookseller in the children and teens department at Politics and Prose. Thank you for joining us and tuning into this format where we continue to bring authors and new books to you. I am thrilled to welcome our guests this evening, Andrew Marinus and Dave Zirin, who are here to celebrate the publication of Andrew's new book, Singled Out, The True Story of Glenn Burke. You can click the link we will drop in the chat to get your own copies of three of Andrew's books. We have signed book plates for Singled Out while supplies last. If you have a question for our guests, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and add one there. At the end of the chat, our guests will have time to answer some of your questions. You can also vote on questions you'd like and want answered. As always, please remember that this is a creative safe space and we ask that folks be respectful of one another in the questions and comments. Now onto the event you're waiting for. Andrew Marinus writes sports and history related nonfiction, telling stories with a larger social message. His first book, Strong Inside, received the Lillian Smith Book Award for Civil Rights and the RFK Book Award Special Recognition Prize for Social Justice, becoming the first sports related books ever to win either award. His young readers adaptation of Strong Inside was named one of the top biographies for youth by the American Library Association. His other book, Games of Deception, received a Sydney Taylor middle grade honor in 2020. Andrew is a contributor to ESPN's DC-based sports and race website, theundefeated.com, and is a visiting author at the Vanderbilt University Athletic Department. He grew up in Washington, DC, and now lives in Nashville. Dave Zirin was named one of the 50 visionaries who are changing our world by the Utney Magazine. He writes about the politics of sports for The Nation magazine, where he is their first sports writer in 150 years of existence, as well as The Progressive and a regular op-ed writer for The Los Angeles Times. Zyron is also the host of The Edge of Sports podcast. We also were just talking about his forthcoming book, Kaepernick, Kaepernick, Kaepernick Effect. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Uh, and I will let them take it away from here. Mm, thank you so much, Ellie. Thank you so much, Politics and Prose. Uh, Glenn Burke. Andrew Marinus. We're going to talk Glenn Burke. I'm so excited. Uh, Glenn Burke, for those who just stumbled upon this call, uh, it was the first out and known LGBTQ Major League Baseball player, as well as the inventor of the high five, which I wish I could give you right now, Andrew. Yes. <laughs> um, now, I just wanted to start by asking you a basic author question. I mean, Ellie just laid it out. You write about very eclectic topics. You are Captain Eclectic. What drew you to this story? Yeah, well, thank you, Dave. First of all, thank you for taking the time to read the book and to host this discussion tonight. I know how busy you are. That means a lot to me. And thanks to Ellie and Politics and Prose. I wish I was there in DC at the store to see everybody in person. Uh, my parents included, uh, Karen Wallace included, the uh, wife of Perry Wallace, the subject of my first book, who lives there in Silver Spring. Um, but I actually do see similarities between these stories, even though, you know, they're a very different subject matter. But my whole mission as an author is to write narrative nonfiction that is related to sports. You can see behind me in my office at home. I mean, it's baseball pennants. It's baseball bats. I, I love sports, but I'm also, you know, uh, I was a history major in college. I, I feel like these stories that I'm trying to tell are not just about the scores of games or you know someone hitting a home run to win a game and they're a hero for that reason. Perry Wallace, my book Strong Inside was the first black basketball player in the SEC. And so that book is about the civil rights movement and what it was like to be a black teenager in Nashville in the deep South during the 1960s. Uh, second book, Games of Deception is about the uh, first US Olympic basketball team at the Nazi Olympics. So it's about uh, fascism and anti-Semitism and the value of uh, the truth and of stepping up and not remaining neutral in the face of injustice. And then this story of Glenn Burke, a uh, story of a first uh, gay major league baseball player, openly gay major league baseball player, inventor of the high five, but really, and most importantly, I think set in the context of the gay rights movement of the 1970s and the backlash to that movement and how that surrounding uh, events in the culture affected Glenn's ability to be the uh, the athlete and the ball player that he wanted to be. 
Mm. I mean, it's a tragic story in so many respects. I mean, the, the very opening pages of the book, uh, it's, it's Glenn Burke alone, without a home, living in poverty. I mean, just a, just a harrowing scene. I mean, so you frame the book with this harrowing scene at the start. But is Glenn Burke's life a tragedy in your mind? Uh, I don't think the outcome of his life is a tragedy. No, I mean, there are tragic moments. Uh, his death certainly was a painful, tragic death uh, of AIDS in the mid 90s. But I think ultimately Glenn's story is a story of hope. You know, uh, when he was laying on his deathbed, he said that he hoped that his experience and the, you know, the challenges that he had navigated through would make it easier for uh, an out uh, ball player in the future, you know, and that his life had meant something in that regard. Um, I still think we're, we're waiting in some respects uh, for those athletes to walk through the door that Glenn helped to open. But I also think that his story is hopeful in the sense that um, hopefully it inspires a sense of empathy in a lot of people uh, who read his story and see how unfairly he was treated merely because of who he was, you know, uh, in, in writing for young adults, in addition to adults, you know, just like you, Dave, like, I hope that, you know, teens will read this book, but also it's fine for adults to read it too. It's not dumbed down in any way. Um, but I think, you know, when you're writing for that age group of teenagers, you're trying to, um, you know, share some elements of, of human nature that you that you would like to see in the world, you know, and I think that empathy is something we need to see more of in the world. Uh, thankfully, I think teens are ready for this story, even more than some adults are, you know, um, teenagers want a story about a gay baseball player, you know, uh, and I, I was speaking in r rural Tennessee, rural North Carolina, and middle schoolers, high schoolers, when I said this was the next book I was working on, they were really excited about it, you know, um, so it's not like I'm talking down to them and saying, you know, you need to pay attention to this. It matters. They know it matters already, but I think they can be inspired by it. Mm. You know, Glenn is, of course, the main character in the book, but I think the second main character in the book is really the Bay Area of the 1960s and 70s. How much was the Bay, what was happening in the Bay in the 60s and 70s, and how did it shape Glenn's identity? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's what a great area to have a chance to write about. Um, Glenn grew up in the B Berkeley, Oakland area, right on the line, moving back and forth, different houses. The playgrounds of that area were really important to him as a young athlete. Bushrod Park is a famous park, uh, and the best players from Berkeley and Oakland would gather there every afternoon to play basketball. And Glenn's a major league baseball player, but even to himself, his identity was primarily as a basketball player. He was a fantastic basketball player. He led his Berkeley high team to an uh, undefeated season, uh, his senior year. Um, just the, the Black Panthers were coming along, you know, at that point in the East Bay as Glenn was growing up, the protests at Cal Berkeley, which were also happening at Berkeley High where he was a student. And so he's immersed in all of that action uh, of the 60s. Um, as a pro ball player, as a, uh, you know, a young man in his 20s, every off season, he would come back to the Bay Area to the other side of the bay, to San Francisco, to the Castro District, which was, you know, uh, the beginnings and the thriving uh, period of the Castro uh, pre-AIDS, where during the baseball offseason, he could come back, be himself, be respected, be beloved as a Major League Baseball player that was in the same bars, you know, as all the other guys that were living in the Castro. Um, and then tragically, when Glenn's run out of baseball, Castro plays a significant role and that he's there as AIDS comes along. And that's where he's living uh, periods of homelessness on the streets of San Francisco, seeing all of his friends uh, or many of his friends uh, dying of this terrible disease that at first, you know, they don't know what it is. And then, um, you know, so the, the Bay Area, like you said, is a character essentially in this book because Glenn spends so much of his life there. Now, your description of 1970s life in the Castro, I found it to be very thoughtful, very detailed, and very important because it's like a, 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 the lost city of Atlantis almost, like it's right. because it, it no longer exists, either in terms of um, affordability or in terms of, of course, this period before HIV. How are you able to do that research to paint such a picture of 1970s Castro life, given the fact of your age, you obviously weren't there 
And right. So, so, it, but it has this great sort of almost first person observational feel. How are you okay. able to do that? Well, um, you know, the same way that I researched the rest of the book, which was by reading books uh, about the, the Castro or about the onset of AIDS and what it felt like to be there at that time. Um, reading newspapers from San Francisco, the mainstream papers, also the LGBT papers there, mm -hmm. um, seeing how um, this, the, the sort of the environment changed, you know, so quickly as this disease came along. And uh, Glenn described it as a, a, like heaven on earth when he was first there. And then quickly it became a hell on earth, interviewing people that were friends of Glenn's at that time. Uh, you know, after he was run out of baseball, he played softball on the gay softball circuit in San Francisco. And can you imagine having a major league center fielder like show up and he's your softball center fielder, right? So they won numerous championships. They were guys that remembered that period. And so I just asked them, you know, what was what was it like? And um, I always consider the, the research for a nonfiction book is by far the most important part, much more important than the, the writing, I think. You know, every sentence on the page has to come from some element of research you've done, whether it's interviews or reading books, old newspaper articles, magazine stories, uh, mm. and trying to paint that picture. So just like you said, people feel like they're there or that the, the author must have been there taking notes all along the way. Uh, writing that type of um, colorful nonfiction, I think is, I mean, it's my favorite type to read. Mm. And that's what I try to create in the books that I write. Now, Glenn Burke has always sort of occupied a, a confusing space in my own mind because um, because after he was driven out of baseball, he comes out officially on the Today Show, um, or was it was Sport Magazine first? Inside, inside sports, sports first. Yeah, Inside Sports first, and then the Today Show. But was Glenn, is it correct to say that Glenn was out as a Major League Baseball player, though? I mean, do you, is, that, is that a sentence you agree with, that as an active player, he was out? I think it, it's a great question. It depends how you define it. You know, he didn't come out to the entire world like you said, until two years after his last professional game in the magazine article and in the Today Show interview. However, he was run out of Major League Baseball because of who he was, you know, so enough people knew that that's the reason why he couldn't pursue his dream. Um, management of the Los Angeles Dodgers knew. They offered Glenn sizable amount of money to get married to cover up the fact that he was gay when he refused to go along with that plan he was traded to the Oakland A's. Billy Martin, the manager of the A's, told reporters he wasn't going to let someone like Glenn Burke, quote unquote, contaminate his team. And so Glenn never got a shot. Once Billy Martin became the manager of the A's, he was sent down to AAA and knew he'd never get called back up again. Uh, as Glenn was making his way up to the major leagues, there were certain friends of his that he trusted that, uh, you know, kind of got in on the secret. Um, as he was playing for the Dodgers, he didn't outright tell Dusty Baker or Davy Lopes or Steve Garvey or Don Sutton, you know, that he was gay, but they started to pick up on it when Glenn would excuse himself from parties where there were a lot of women there, right? Or when they would go dancing at the discos, Glenn was by far the best dancer and was, you know, everybody wanted to dance with Glenn, but then he would go home alone at the end of the night. When the team got back from road trips, all the players would be picked up by their wives or girlfriends at one side of the airport. Glenn would disappear to the whole other side of the airport to get picked up by who knows who, you know? Um, and so people were starting to figure it out. And so I think, uh, and then also I should say during the off season, pre-social media, Glenn felt completely protected in the Castro. So he was living an out life every off season. Hundreds, thousands of people knew that he was gay in, in that neighborhood of San Francisco. And it wasn't, you know, a picture of him tweeted out for the world to see. So, you know, I guess it just depends how you define it. He, he certainly wasn't completely in the closet and he was run out of the game because of who he was. But he had well, the reasons we've seen, Yeah. One of the reasons why we've seen athletes uh, be more political in recent years, you just said it is social media and the ability to just express what you think and put it out in the public without having to worry about a sports media that is still, I think, very conservative and very homogeneous. Um, do you think that hypothetically, that if there had been a columnist who was gay or who wasn't white, that Glenn would have gone public while wearing Dodgers blue? Um, that's a really 
Good question. I don't think so. I think he was concerned that it would cost him his career, even if it was a sympathetic writer, that the, the publicity was not something he wanted. There was a, a former lover of his named Michael Smith who ended up writing that Inside Sports article. And initially, Glenn wasn't really, he wasn't too excited about that. You know, Michael Smith had been pushing him to come out during his uh, playing career. It was someone he trusted, just like he said, he wasn't black, but he was his lover, you know, and he, he didn't want to do it. Um, he, he expect the only reason he went along with the inside sports article, even two years after his playing days is two things. One, he thought that by coming out, it would be clear why he was no longer playing in the major leagues. It wasn't because he wasn't good enough. It was because these teams didn't want him. And so maybe he would get another chance. He also at that time was, you know, struggling for money. And uh, he thought that Smith was going to split the money with him from this article and he never got a penny of it. Um, so I, I don't think that Glenn uh, would have done this during his playing days. He was concerned it would cost his career. And of course, even without the article, he, he lost his career. Yeah, I mean, we lost the opportunity to watch Glenn Burke play because of homophobia. Um, how good could Glenn Burke have been if he'd played in a major league baseball that was open and accepting and allowed him to just play his sport without worrying about all this stuff. Yeah, and this is a really interesting question because there was someone on Twitter today that was taking shots at Glenn Burke, seeing that there's been some publicity about him now, you know, and saying he wasn't run out of the game. He, you know, played himself out of the game by not being good enough. Um, so let's talk about Glenn as an athlete. Like I said, he was a phenomenal basketball player. Even with, he played he was one of the first players after the NCAA uh, changed its rules to allow professional players in one sport to play collegiately in another. He played for a semester at Nevada, Reno, which I think is interesting, uh, Dave, with your uh, interest in Colin Kaepernick, that both of these sort of social trailblazers went to uh, Reno. Um, so just to say he was a great athlete, all of the, um, his teammates just marveled at how strong he was, how high he could jump. These are his baseball teammates that were saying this. In the minor leagues, he hit over 300 five times. He set stolen base records in two different levels of the minor leagues. Uh, Junior Gilliam, who was the longtime player and coach for the Dodgers, said that Glenn Burke had the potential to be the next Willie Mays. Um, and plenty of players haven't fulfilled their high potential, but that's how he was perceived as he was nearing the major leagues. Um, Dusty Baker said that Glenn Burke got a jump on the ball in the outfield as well as any center fielder he had ever seen. Uh, he had a strong arm, could steal bases. He had power as a young hitter. He never really showed that power in the major leagues. But at that point in the 70s, you know, being a kid watching the game, hating the St. Louis Cardinals, right, who were all these kind of quick guys with no power. Well, I'm rooting for the Milwaukee Brewers, so all they could do is hit home runs. Just to say there was room for a good defensive outfielder, you know, who was fast like Glenn Burke in the 1970s. And probably more important than any of that is that we don't know how good Glenn could have been had he been free to be himself. Mm. And baseball being such a mental game where players, you know, have to get into a certain zone and compartmentalize and push out the rest of the world to play at their highest level. Glenn could never fully be who he was. He said he was always playing with uh, one eye looking over his shoulder. He said at times he didn't know if he even wanted to be as good as he could be because then there would be a lot of attention on him. The spotlight would be on him and then maybe the secret would get out. And so we have no idea how good Glenn could have been, but all the ingredients were in place for him to be a legit major league ball player. And he started game one of the world series when he was a rookie. Wow, what, what a comment that is. Um, we're starting to get some questions. Please folks, keep them coming. We're going to, um, uh, ask those questions in just a few minutes. I have a couple more questions, so I'm going to, keep loading Andrew up with them. Right. I mean, I'm going to ask the, the obvious question here. I mean, have things really gotten that much better in major league baseball? I mean, no, I mean, it, that, the Glenn Burke story, I mean, it, we're going, we're talking 45 years ago. I mean, no one, no active player has come out in baseball. Um, I remember several years ago, a baseball player holding a press conference just to tell people he wasn't gay. Right. We heard rumors to that effect. Um, so have things gotten better in the baseball? You know, I was, uh, I interviewed Billy Bean for the book and he was, uh, and there's two Billy Beans in baseball. This is not the Oakland A's, uh, executive, but Billy Bean, who was the second, uh, 
former major league player to come out, played for the Padres. He now works for Major League Baseball. And I was asking him, you know, what are the reasons why players haven't come out as active players? And he was explaining to me about just the financial calculation that the gay players who are in Major League Baseball right now, we just don't know that they're gay, have to make where they know that their window as a professional athlete is very short, but there's a lot of money in it during that short window. And mm-hmm. is it worth risking that? Why not wait five years? Come out when, you're, when your playing days are over. Uh, you're writing a book about the reaction to Colin Kaepernick and how that's rippled through society. You can look at him. It's not apples to apples comparison, but it's similar. You just don't know what the reaction is going to be. And I think it can be down to, you know, what's your own team's locker room like? Who are the team leaders there? What tone are they going to set? Who's the head coach or the manager of the team, the general manager, the owner, the city that you're playing in? I think all of those sort of factor into the decisions people have to make. The one thing I would point to in hopes of um, to show that things have changed last year, baseball fans remember uh, the Reds announcer Tom Brennan and made a homophobic remark on the air. And there was quick reaction to that. You know, that was the last game that he broadcast. There were Reds players and other players around Major League Baseball that condemned what he said very quickly uh, in the aftermath of that game. And to me, that was that seemed kind of new to me, that especially baseball compared to other sports, which to me seem a little bit more progressive than baseball, that you did have baseball players who were willing to step up. Now you've got Sean Doolittle, the old national I know who's popular there in D.C. playing for the Reds. So I'm interested in how he might sort of uh, enter this conversation. I want to get him a copy of the book. But, you know, and and also talking to Billy Bean, he senses that clubhouses are changing a little bit, you know. Mm. So you you don't know what the reaction is going to be. I have some hope that it would be much more positive. And I think that even in this polarized country, there would be a, a huge element of baseball fans and just people out there in the country that would love this story if, if a good player came out as gay. And I think that their jersey would probably shoot up and be the number one selling jersey right away. Maybe not everybody would be for it, but a lot of people would. Hmm. It's something I was wrestling with when I was reading the book, and I'm not sure where I fall on this, and I wanted your thoughts of I'd love to see Major League Baseball put this book into every clubhouse. I'd love to have Major League Baseball promote this book at games. I, I'd love to see this become, you know, something that players actually read um, so they know the full history of the game that they play. But then there's this other part of me that's like wondering, are we really comfortable with MLB celebrating Glenn Burke? Because this is also the sport that drove him away. Right. And there's something about that, that that doesn't sit quite quite right it's similarly the way I feel when there's Jackie Robinson day and I think well wait a minute there was only one team that even said let's let's end the color line in major league baseball in 19 like like so so, and they gave Jackie Robinson hell and then they celebrate him as if that history isn't a part of it so what are your thoughts about major league baseball re-embracing Glenn Burke right well first I'll answer sort of cynically and humorously, if they want to buy a book for every major league baseball player, you know, that, that's good with me. Um, <laughs> I'm for that too. I'm pro that, to be clear. Uh, the other thing I'll say is, you know, there was a, a similar scenario with Perry Wallace, the subject of my first book, first black basketball player in the SEC, who tells the truth about his experience as a young man in the 1960s and is run out of town for it, you know. And then 40 years later, uh, my alma mater, Vanderbilt, Perry's alma mater comes back to him and wants to celebrate him. You know, uh, it's new people uh, recognizing that his story was important, that he's been telling the truth all along. Well, Perry had a decision to make whether he wanted to participate in that or not. It was kind of like, could have used you 40 years ago. Now that it's good publicity for you, of course, you want to invite me back. But what Perry said to me was reconciliation without the truth is just acting. You Mm. know, and a lot of organizations want these moments of reconciliation publicly. If the truth isn't there, if we haven't discussed why we're in the situation in the first place, then it's just for show he wanted no part of that. But if the truth is present, then it can be a powerful moment of change. And he was willing to participate in that. And it ended up being really powerful on the Vanderbilt campus. Mm -hmm. So I would say the same thing would apply for Glenn Burke. the truth needs to be present. So let's not just, you know, put a picture of him up on Twitter uh, during Pride Month and and say he was the first openly gay player without 
you know, really telling the full story, right? And so that's what I think uh, would be necessary. And if that conversation is able to be had with somebody like Billy Bean participating in it, honest conversations with the Dodgers and the A's involved, uh, other former players, current players talking about it, people reading the book and discussing all the issues in it, then I think that could only be a good thing. Well, it's a great book for that. I'm about to go to people's questions, but I, I just have to ask you this. Um, Glenn had style. Um, and I don't, I didn't know if this was a myth or not, but then you wrote it. And now I'm wondering if this is a myth. Uh, did he really wear boots with aquariums in the heels and fish in the heels of the boot? <laughs> I never saw it. I didn't see a picture of it, but I read it a couple places. I believe it. I did interview some of his minor league teammates that talked about what a fantastic dresser, cool dresser, fly dresser that Glenn Burke was in those days. He did have a collection of really cool hats in the 1970s. Uh, he wore a, a red jock strap, <laughs> you know, when everybody else was wearing the plain old white jock strap. So I, I believe it, Dave. I, I believe that that is true. He loved Rudy Ray Moore. You know, if people have seen that Dolomite movie, that, you know, and so he just sort of embraced that whole side of uh, Black 70s culture. Um, and I, I, I believe it. And he invented the high five. Yeah. Which is amazing. <laughs> All right. So th thank you so much, Andrew. That, 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 I mean, you helped me with some of my issues right. <laughs> that I was dealing with. <laughs> Help but me with really my issues next, Dave, please. No, no, your, your answer about MLB and Glenn Burke and talking about Perry Wallace, that was, that, that was terrific. I'm going right. to watch the recording of this and replay that. Um, <laughs> I, so first question here is from uh, Mark J, Mark Johnson. Um, he says, congratulations on another great book, Andrew. Please talk a little bit about Glenn's supportive teammates. It strikes me something like the stories about Pee Wee Reese and Jackie Robinson in an earlier generation. So... Glenn's support of teammates. And thank you, Mark, for the question. Mark has a great new book out called Tuesday Night Massacre about the center races of 1980 that people should check out also. Um, but what's one thing that's kind of tragic about Glenn's life is that, you know, he's run out of this game when people are not willing to accept him for who he was mm. when his whole life was about supporting other people. You know, even playing basketball as a kid in, at Bushrod Park, he was the one that would select the kids that nobody else wanted for their team. You know, that maybe the kids that weren't that good or out of shape or for whatever reason were standing there waiting to get picked. Glenn would take them. And at one level, it was a nice thing to do. But another, it was like the ultimate badass thing to do because he would still win, even with these guys that weren't the best players. You know, um, his teammates said they weren't surprised that it was Glenn Burke that invented the high five because he was always supporting his teammates. And I was a little surprised in talking to guys like Dusty Baker, even having worked for a major league team myself, how competitive these players were with each other, you know? And so the idea of celebrating a teammate's success wasn't as much of a no brainer as you might think it would be even amongst teammates. And Glenn was the guy that always supported everybody else. He was the guy that was sort of uh, the pulse of the locker room, could tense when it was tense and would lighten things up. And so the fact that he was there celebrating Dusty Baker's home run, uh, which is the reason why this high five was invented, was totally within uh, Glenn's character. Uh, he's high fiving people even in the Castro. After he's run out of baseball, he's sitting on a car. The stories go, many people say this outside of bars in the Castro, high fiving uh, men as they walked by. You know, uh, that was just a part of who he was. But when he needed people, when he was reaching out his hand, instead of high five, you know, reaching up his hand, there were very few people that, you know, took his hand and helped him when he needed it the most. Wow. Daisy W. wants to know, what was your favorite part of the research process for this book? Oh, I loved the whole research process. Uh, one thing that was cool for me just as a baseball fan was going out to Oakland and being in the A's clubhouse, you know, before a game while there's the loud music playing and all the guys are getting ready for the game. And I was interviewing Steve Vucinich, who's their longtime clubhouse manager, of the A's and had worked for the team back when Glenn was there. Um, he told me a story about Glenn being the first major league player to wear Nikes in a game. I had no idea about that. And so I got in touch with the old uh, Nike rep from the seventies. He was one of the first like 10 employees of Nike. He was also a malt vendor 
uh, at Dodger Stadium because he wasn't sure if this Nike company was going to really pan out, you know. Um, and so I get to tell that whole side of the story, too. Uh, I found one of Glenn's lovers who uh, owned a basically a bed and breakfast outside of San Francisco, who's now retired in Hawaii and just had seen his name mentioned offhand in an article. He had an unusual first name, so I was able to Google him. And when he emailed back from Hawaii and was able to shed light on a whole aspect of Glenn's life that I wouldn't have been able to get any other way, that was another one of those sort of uh, gold mine moments. Mm. Uh, Larry Shaneman wants to know, I think I know how you're gonna answer this one. He, he says, congrats on the book, my copy arrives tomorrow. Mike Mussina was asked once, what it would be like to play alongside a gay teammate and Musina answered, given the actuarial facts, I assume I already have. Uh, do you think that's true? Go Vandy. <laughs> yeah, Larry's a, a good Commodore. Um, hi, Larry. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. I mean, it's true. <laughs> what else is there to say? You know, there have been gay players throughout the history of the game. Uh, Glenn talked about the fact that there were several National League All-Stars during the period that he was playing that were closeted uh, gay uh, men. Um, Billy Bean has told me, you know, he knows of several gay players in the game now. Uh, they just have chosen not to come out yet. Mm. And um, Katie G is a great question that, that I was sort of also wrestling with when I was reading. Is Glenn's story well known in the sports world or has his story been continued to be swept under the rug? Um, you know, there have been moments where his story has been out there. I mean, a big article in Inside Sports in 1982 when he came out, uh, a live interview with Brian Gumbel on the Today Show in 1982 uh, when he came out. Those stories were overshadowed by AIDS, though. You know, that was the big story of the day at that time. Uh, I don't think a whole lot of the typical sports writers of that era were really interested in writing about a gay major league player. Uh, there was one man named Eric Sherman who did write about Glenn, helped Glenn write an autobiography. Uh, Ghost wrote the autobiography for Glenn in 1995, spent a week with Glenn as he was passing away. And I write in the book about the um, really unfortunate reception that Eric got from publishers in New York who said they weren't interested in the book. You know, so you imagine you probably chalk that up to homophobia in the publishing industry in the 90s. Like, well, how could you not be interested in that book? So um, Eric self-published it. And, you know, that's tough in the pre-internet age. How do you get the word out about your self-published book in 1995? Um, since then, there hasn't been much uh, said or written about Glenn. And so, you know, that was an opportunity for me to try to tell this story. And I feel like in some ways it's a, it's a shame that this story was still available to be told. But another regard, you know, I think maybe right now is, is the right time for this story to be out there. There was an episode of Cheers in their first season about Sam Malone having yes. a teammate who came out and wrote a book about it called, I still remember, it was called Behind the Mask because he was a catcher. It's a great <laughs> title for a book. And um, it, it's stunning that they could do that in, in Make Believe in 1982, but then in the 90s, not wanting to, to publish his story. Right. There's a lot. Um, Hannah Sawa wants to know how long it took you to research this. Okay. Uh, well, I'll answer that first by saying my first book, Strong Inside, took me eight years, uh, four years of research and four years of writing. I didn't have a contract or a publisher as I was working on that book. So I had all the time I needed. And, you know, for better or worse, for better, I got to know Perry Wallace so much better over the course of eight years. Uh, for this book, I had a contract that required it to be done in a year. Um, I started a little bit before I had signed the contract. So it took me a little over a year. Uh, roughly split in half between the research and the writing. Mm. Uh, J John Edgel is curious. Uh, he says, with a sister who's also an established writer, can you tell us about the influence of your parents and your career? Um, rumor has it that your father has written a couple of books. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that rumor too. Uh, so my father, uh, David, has written, I think, 12 or 13 books. Um, he didn't start writing books until after I graduated from college. So I didn't grow up with an author in the family, but I did grow up with a writer in the family. He was at the Washington Post um, my whole life. And uh, so I was reading a good newspaper every day, whether it was his stories or the sports section, you know, just like he reads the sports section first, so do I, you know. So I think just being around a good newspaper every day 
the people that would come to our house, you know, or John Feinstein or Bob Woodward, you know, so I was around these amazing writers uh, my whole life. My mom's actually the first person in the family to write a book. Uh, she's an environmentalist and wrote a book about the Gulf of Mexico for kids. Um, and so just the idea of the, writing a book is something that you can do. Uh, I, I saw that firsthand. Um, and then, but I would say, that, you know, for a big stretch of my life, uh, I avoided it. You know, I went to college on a sports writing scholarship, but my first job out of school that I could get was kind of on the other side, doing PR for sports. I was the basketball sports information director at Vandy, and then for the Tampa Bay Rays. Then I worked for a PR firm for almost 20 years, and I kind of missed the chance to write, in, uh, you know, write about sports. And that's when I got started writing this book on Perry Wallace. And certainly my, the influences in the family were important. I know everything I know about writing thanks to reading, uh, mostly my dad's work, you know. So mm. it's there as that type of influence, not as a super hands-on influence in terms of writing the books. My mom is the best editor in the family and, and she sends back handwritten notes uh, on pages, you know. Wow. Um, Angela Alston asks, um, can you speak to Glenn's relationship with his family and the black community, um, given the African-American church's position on homosexuality during the 1970s? Was his family accepting of him as a gay man? Um, yes, elements of Glenn's family were accepting of him. Um, his sister, Lutha, is, you know, one of the angels of the world, you know, and, and Lutha uh, took Glenn in as he was uh, dying and sat up with him every night as he was in incredible pain, rubbing his feet, uh, you know, feeding him, bathing him, getting him into the hospital. Uh, his sister Paula, I interviewed for the book as well, supportive. I got the sense that there were some members of the family that might not have quite have been as supportive, but he was feeling that uh, from lo that love from most of his family. Um, and I asked that same question to some uh, Black people that I was interviewing for the book about the homophobia that you hear about within the Black church and got some really interesting answers back uh, in the sense that I mean, how it's almost like, how dare you ask that, you know, look, let's look at the homophobia in the white community, you know, um, and, and so like, why are we pointing it out that it exists in some elements of, of the Black community, you know, um, Glenn was, was a very popular person among straight people and gay people. He was charismatic, you know, and I have a, a passage in the book about how he basically changed the attitudes of, of people in this town of Gurneyville, California, single-handedly uh, about LGBT issues when he brought his gay softball team up from San Francisco to play against the straight bar in this town and the gay team won easily. And then after the game, everybody hung out in each other's bars, you know, and just that presence that Glenn had among white people and black people, anybody he was around couldn't help but really sort of just fall in love with this guy. He was funny, and charismatic. He had played major league baseball. People just wanted to be around Glenn Burke. What, what, what a great story that is. I love that part of the book. Um, it, was, it was such a nugget. I love yeah, it. Yeah. Um, that came from the guy in Hawaii, you know, and I never would have, learned that story if I hadn't found him out there. You were, you were panning for gold and were successful. <laughs> right. Sonia Milborn wants to know, she says, congratulations on the new book, Andrew. Has your role as a father and conversations you've had with your children been an asset in writing with a younger audience in mind? Well, that's a great question. And hi to Sonia out in Kansas. Um, I think so. I mean, my role as a father influences my books in all kinds of ways. Uh, my mom can attest to this when we do Zooms, my son is usually sitting on top of my head uh, at all hours of the day. So it makes writing difficult when there's a seven-year-old sitting on your head. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, my role as a dad in, in reading books to the kids, thinking about the types of stories that I would like them to learn and to read about, whether they're seven and 10 years old or in a few years from now. And then the chance pre-COVID to go visit schools that has had a huge impact on me. And my reason for wanting to continue to write for teens is visiting schools and especially meeting the kids or hearing a story from the librarian about a kid who maybe is an athlete or who likes to watch sports on TV or play sports video games, but doesn't spend a whole lot of time in the library, finding books that appeal to that kid, you know, um, 
and that they, you know, they'll say, oh, they liked your book. And so I think having a, a book with a basketball player on the cover or a baseball player on the cover doesn't seem intimidating to a middle school kid or a high school student. So maybe they'll give that one a try. And then the book has a lot more to say than just about sports. And so, yeah, that's what I'm all about right now. Mm. Anasawa, great question. How or when did you first hear about Glenn Burke? Uh, well, first heard about him in 1978 when I was eight years old. I had his Topps baseball card, you know, and so I remembered his baseball card when I got started working on this book. Um, the decision to write the book was took place in a conversation with my literary agent, Alex Shane, um, who I was talking to him about the fact that, you know, after Strong Inside and Games of Deception, I still wanted to write books about sports with the larger social uh, message at play. And we were just batting around ideas and Alec, uh, you know, said that there had never been a young adult book about Glenn Burke. And as soon as he said that, I was like, yeah, that, that's it. What I think is also true is there has not been a biography of a gay male American athlete ever. But there's been autobiographies, memoirs, but maybe Bill Tilden, like a book written decades and decades ago. Um, but, you know, in baseball, basketball, football, the, the sort of the big three sports, I don't think there has been a biography of a gay male athlete in the United States, whether it's positioned as a young adult book or an adult book. Wow, yeah, none, none comes to mind. That's, that's really stunning. Uh, Ethan Shiner says, congrats on the book. In recent years, we've seen more professional athletes coming out, but usually only after retirement. Do you have any sense of whether Glenn is an important figure to them as a role model and also as a cautionary tale, which led them only coming out after retirement? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and hey to Ethan. Ethan's son is 14 years old and is the best teenage podcast, sports podcaster in the country. So people need to check out. I think it's Casey at, at the bat is his Twitter handle, something close to that. That's okay. um, <laughs> uh, I don't know that how well no Glenn is known among modern day ball players. I mean, I think that's one thing that was interesting, Dave, about your idea of introducing this book to current players. I, I suspect uh, that there were probably some players that may have read the excerpt in the undefeated or read the ex excerpt in the New York times last week, who that's their introduction to Glenn Burke, you know, um, just like you said at the outset, I don't think his name is really that well known. I think when they read the story, it could have, uh, either effect. It, it could be inspiring in the sense that, you know, let, let's build on this progress that Glenn Burke made. Um, it's a cautionary tale too, and you just don't know what the reaction is going to be from your franchise. And so I, I really think that it's comes down to such an individual decision based on the unique circumstances of any team and any uh, person's um, life circumstances, whether it's worth it to come out as an active player. Mm, one more question, and then I'd love it if you could give us some last words of wisdom, Andrew. All right. Um, Keith Cartwright said, you mentioned Glenn thought he was going to receive half the money from the Inside Sports Magazine article. What made him think he would be paid? That seems well out of the norm for agreeing to be interviewed for a story. Well, he thought he would be paid because the author of the story was his former lover, Michael Smith. Uh, so they were kind of in on the story together in that regard. And he thought that, that Michael was going to share the money. He told him he would. There was also a, a, a circumstance where a, a house that they had uh, bought and renovated together, Glenn's name was never put on the deed. So he was, he was done wrong by this man uh, a few times. Mm, and, I, and Keith also wrote a comment, which I, I, I feel was worth reading. He said, the people who drove Glenn out of the game uh, were not necessarily part of the game 40 plus years ago. It should not be held against people today who want to do the right thing. That's how we grow as people. What's your response right. to that? Um, well, first of all, Keith is a good friend here in Nashville. He's got a book coming out this fall on Black Cowboys, uh, which is gonna be a fantastic book. Um, I, I'm not sure I understood the, the question about not holding what was done 40 years ago against who? Uh, like holding it against baseball. I think it's a reference yeah. when I when I said about my, my own discomfort with Major League Baseball claiming Glenn Burke when they drove him away. Right. Uh, I think it's a fair debate. I mean, I know there were people on both sides of the issue of uh, Major League Baseball uh, incorporating Negro League Baseball uh, statistics. Yeah. You know, I think it's similar in the sense that, well, 
<laughs> you didn't take us back then. So, you know, thanks a lot for including the records now. On one hand, on the other hand, it is nice to see those records alongside the major league players from those days. So um, baseball claiming Glenn Burke, if, if it's done the right way, I think is significant. If it's, if it's just on a surface level and not acknowledging the problems that were there back then, then the current generation is just inheriting the same homophobia that was there in the 70s. Mm, there's some wisdom from Perry Wallace in that statement, for sure. That's right. Um, any last words, any last thoughts, Andrew? This has been absolutely terrific. I've learned a ton. I think the people on this on this Zoom are, are having a blast, at least based on a couple texts I got from people. Um, so so any, any last words or thoughts? No, I mean, just to say that I'm appreciative of this chance to talk to you, Dave. I admire the work that you do. I'm looking forward to your book. I'm thankful for people tuning in. I know that they've been on a lot of Zooms over the last year. <laughs> and to, to do another one <laughs> means a lot to me. I mean, selfishly, I would say if people like the book to please tell a friend, you know, or put a picture up on social media uh, without the chance to go visit book festivals or bookstores and libraries, that word of mouth is, it's always important, but it's even more important now. So uh, thank you wow. to everybody. That's a great point. Now I'll turn it over to uh, Ellie Bloomberg. Ellie. Thank you so much. Thank you both for your words and insights. This is an incredible conversation. Thank you everyone for your questions. One more question actually, what are both of you reading right now? I'll go first because I think Andrew should have the last word on this <laughs> talk and conversation. I just found a book that was out of print that people have been telling me to read for years. Uh, it's called The Devil and Sonny Liston by Nick Toskis. And it, it's so good. And um, I think Toskis just passed, passed away in the last couple of years. And it, it's just, it, it's the kind of sports writing that, that I still aspire to. Dave, before I answer, uh, can you please tell everybody about your book that's coming out uh, in the fall? Oh, you're, you're way too kind. Um, I got a book coming out this fall called The Kaepernick Effect. It's about young people who took a knee in the last four years and how it affected their lives and their community. Uh, that's great. I can't wait for that one. Um, the two books that I'll mention, one it has, is a DC connection, you know, with this uh, taking place with the politics and prose in DC is I Came as a Shadow, Jesse Washington uh, book that he wrote with John Thompson, the Georgetown coach. My favorite basketball team as a kid, my first favorite basketball team was Georgetown. Growing up in DC during the Patrick Ewing era, having season tickets, going to all those games, loving Boy, the whole yeah, <laughs> boy, a paranoia, you know, and um, that was that was my team. So I love that book. And then a book that came out just this week, the same day that mine did, is End Papers by Alexander Wolf, uh, the great sports writer from Sports Illustrated. This is not a sports book. Uh, it's a look into his own family history, tracing back to Germany during the Nazi period. And then, you know, immigrants coming to the United States, founding a publishing house, major publisher in New York. A uh, fascinating book that I, I've just gotten started and wanted to give a, a shout out to Alex. He's been a great mentor of mine. Thank what you both you, so Ellie? much. Sorry, what go ahead. Ellie, what are you reading? Oh, uh, I'm actually just starting, finally, Watch Us Rise, Renee Watson and Ellen Hagen. Uh, I love it so far. They're both amazing writers. Renee Watson, I've read some of her other books. So I'm really excited to read more of this. Awesome. Yeah. Heck yeah. Thank you both for joining us so much. This has been amazing. And thank you to the audience for coming to see us and for sharing your questions. Uh, don't forget, you can still click the link in the chat box to get your copy of Singled Out. And to find out about more events, check out our website for updated listings. You can also follow our Children and Teens Department on social media. The handle is also posted in the chat. And you can watch our past events on our Politics and Prose YouTube channel. You can also rewatch this one if you want. Uh, thanks again, everyone. Keep reading widely and exploring.